In this video, I'll show you how to sleep the ESP32 microcontroller, then wake it up using a motion sensor. This is exactly what you need to build your own security monitoring device. Later in the video, I'll share my tips for not going absolutely crazy trying to get the sensor to work properly, because it can be a real hassle to configure. To build this device, you'll need a PIR sensor, a few jumper cables, and of course an ESP32. I've also used a mini LED traffic light to give us some indication as to what's going on when it's not connected to a computer. You could use individual LEDs, or just comment out the LED code entirely. So here's the code required, and if you want to copy and paste it into your own applications, there's a link in the description. So at the top of the sketch, we define our variables. So I have three of these, one for each of the LEDs on the mini traffic light. We also define the motion sensor pin, which I've set to 32. If you're using it to wake up the ESP32, then it must be a RTC pin. I've linked to this really useful diagram in the description. So here you can see all the pins of the regular ESP32. If you're using a slightly different one to the one I'm using, then it may have fewer pins. So to use a sensor to wake up the ESP32, you have to plug the data line into an RTC pin. So these are indicated in this orangey yellow here. So as you can see, there are plenty of pins that you could potentially use. Next, I've used a wake up counter variable, and this is initialized and set to zero. And we'll be able to use this to make a count of how many times the ESP32 is woken up. The RTC underscore data underscore ATTR prefix is really important. The ESP32 has 8 kilobytes of memory, which is preserved when the ESP32 is switched off and goes to sleep. So by prefixing our variable with this, we can use it even when the ESP32 goes to sleep. So I'll run through the setup routine now. So for the LEDs, we set the pin mode to output. That means that we can send voltage to the LEDs. And we'll set the motion sensor as input. We'll also increment the wake up counter. So every time the ESP32 wakes up, it will run the setup routine. We'll also initialize the serial port. And this is really useful because we can send out comments to the serial port when it's connected to a computer. So that's really useful for troubleshooting. So I have put in a few print statements. So if you connect it to the computer, then you should be able to see what's happening. So there is a if else statement here. And if the wake up counter is greater than one, that means that it has previously gone to sleep. So the first time you download the code to the device and start it up, the wake up counter will always be one. So it won't trigger this code here. It will just sleep the device. So I put the sleep device code into a function. We'll scroll down and see that. So we'll look at this first. I have just put in a quick loop for LED flashing. So it will flash the LED, the yellow LED, five times just before it goes to sleep. So that's kind of useful for troubleshooting. You could comment this out if you don't want to use the LEDs. So we need a couple of lines here to sleep the device and ensure it wakes up using the sensor again. So this method is really critical one. It's ESP underscore sleep underscore enable underscore EXT zero underscore wake up. So quite a long function name. So basically you set a pin number. So you feed in a pin number as the first parameter. So the second parameter can be either high or low and this depends on whether you want the sensor to send a high voltage or no voltage to wake the device up again. So for the peer sensor, we want it as high. So if it sends a high voltage from the sensor, it will wake up the ESP32. Note that we are using EXT0 here. There is also an EXT1 function, although it do does have different parameters. EXT1 you can use if you want multiple sensors to potentially wake up the ESP32. This is really useful if you want to build a home security device and you want more than one sensor. But for this example, we'll just use EXT0. So once this is set, the really critical thing is that this doesn't actually sleep the device. You need to call this one ESP underscore deep underscore sleep underscore start. 
So this is the method that will actually put the ESP32 to sleep. So now that the ESP32 is sleeping, what happens is that if it detects voltage on pin 32, then it will start up again. So it will call the setup routine. And this time, because the wake up counter will be two or greater than two, it will go to here and it will print ESP32 has woken up and then it will go to the trigger alert method. So this method will be called when the ESP32 wakes up from sleep because it's detected motion. So I just print out a simple line here. There's a routine here that will flash the red LED five times. So whatever you want to do when the ESP32 wakes up, you could like get it to send an email or go to a specific website or do something else. So all your code will go into the trigger alert method here. I should just mention that we don't need the loop method. So there is no code here, unlike most sketches. So once you've done whatever it wants to do, we call the sleep device method again, and it will go back to sleep. As I said before, the wake up counter will increment every time the motion sensor is triggered to wake up the device. So you might want to log this or maybe even like log the time of whenever it was woken up. So now we've written our code, let's test the device. So I have already uploaded it to the device. So you notice that there's a bowl here and the sensor is underneath here. Later in the video, I'll go through some really valuable troubleshooting tips for getting the peer sensor to work because it can be quite troublesome. One of the best tips I read was to use a cup or something like that that's totally opaque and put the peer sensor under it. So if I open this, then it should sense some light. And you can see it has said here, the ESP32 is woken up, the red LED is flashing. Now it's going back to sleep. And now it's also detected motion again, so it's woken up. So if I put the bowl back on, it should go to sleep and not wake up again. I should also mention that the peer sensor has a bit of a cool down period. So if you don't put the lid on quickly enough, then it might trigger again. So as you can see, it's sleeping nicely. If I lift up the bowl, then it wakes up again. First of all, I'd recommend buying good quality sensors. I really like this AZ delivery one. It's well made, well labeled, and has the optional jumper to change the mode. More on that jumper later, assuming your peer sensor has one. It also has documentation, although the English is really just a jumble of random words. It's really difficult to understand. Compare this one with the sensor I bought from AliExpress, which was cheaper, but I'm not even sure if it works properly. I bought this DHT11 temperature sensor at the same time, and it no longer works at all. So this is a nice diagram I found of the sensor. So yours should look similar to this. You may or may not have this jumper here. You almost certainly will have these two adjusters here. Uh, more on these later. Finally, there are three pins here. One is for power, one is for ground, and the middle one usually is the output one. Something really important to consider is that sometimes the power and the ground are on the different side, but almost always the output is the middle pin. So definitely check on your specific peer sensor. If your sensor didn't come with documentation, then all you can do is to pop off the Fresnel lens like this. So once you popped it off, sometimes you'll find that there are labels on the sensor board on this side. So mine are labeled here. Now let's talk about the jumper. Yours might be labeled or not labeled. You might not even have a jumper at all, as is the case with my cheap AliExpress one. So if they're labeled, you might see H or L labels or both. It's wrong to assume L is on the edge closest to the adjustable screws. Here's an example I found online where the jumpers are in the opposite orientation to my particular peer sensor. So when H is selected, the sensor will output high when it's repeatedly triggered. When L is selected, it will only output high when the sensor is triggered. I've put mine on H. It's probably a better setting if you want to make a security camera. The sensor has two potentiometers you can adjust with a small screwdriver. 
Usually the one on the left facing us is to adjust sensitivity. On mine I've turned it clockwise as far as it will go. Apparently it will sense up to 7 meters or 3 meters if you turn it anti-clockwise as far as it will go. Note that the distance isn't really standardized with different peer sensors so the actual distance will depend on which peer sensor you've bought. The other potentiometer is used to change the delay. I've turned mine clockwise as far as it will go, which is 5 seconds on mine. Turning it the other way will delay to 5 minutes. Don't use this delay if you're testing it, it will drive you crazy. But it is a useful setting if you want to build a security light which stays on for a while after activity is detected. Now let's talk about how to test the peer sensor and I had real problems when I was trying to get my device up and running. First of all, the sensor doesn't always work reliably if it's too close to other electronics. You could try using tin foil, but really the best thing I've found is to use longer cables. It's also important to note that it detects changes in infrared. It doesn't detect motion unless the motion changes the pattern of infrared radiation. You will probably encounter issues testing in a sunny room or in a room where you're using a convection heater. I think this is the main problem I had when I was first trying to test mine because it's winter and my room heater is on all day and night. Also, if your desk is quite small or you're using a laptop, then your computer's fan might also be blowing out heat. I found the best way to test is to put a cup or bowl over the sensor. Bear in mind the sensor has a cooldown period, so don't be too hasty. It also takes a few seconds to start up and calibrate itself. If you have any other problems with the peer sensor, then drop a comment below. Thanks for watching.